got a lot uh, on their schedules these days. We're really grateful that you took the time. We're grateful for our speakers, James and Darren, who we're going to hear, who we will hear from in a minute. Um, I know we've been on a lot of Zoom calls in the last couple months, uh, but just as a reminder, if you could please mute yourself when you're not speaking so everybody can hear, we will be using the chat for questions. So if you have them during the presentation, please feel free to use that. And um, again, uh, I want to make sure that we give a chance, have an opportunity to thank uh, Kinney Bunk Savings without their support, these important, we wouldn't be able to offer these important programs and conversations. So um, Kelly, thank you so much. And uh, to you and to Kinney Bunk for this opportunity. Uh, would you like to share anything with anybody with us? Sorry, having an issue with my mute. <laughs> It's our pleasure to be able to um, sponsor these virtual events. Um, you know, for a while, this is going to be our new norm, I think, for a little bit while longer. Um, so uh, we are very pleased to have this opportunity. So thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Again, we appreciate the support. These, these conversations are so important now more than ever. And uh, we're grateful for Kenny Bank Savings for allowing us to continue to have them. So thank you. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to this week's Virtual Connect speakers, uh, James Murray, who serves as the Town of Exeter's um, Health Inspector, and Darren Wenham, who serves as the Town's Economic Development Director. I think it's um, an understatement to say that um, you two have been uh, uh, critical over the last six months to the businesses in the Exeter area and our community. So thank you for everything that you've done to support us and, um, and will continue to do to support us. So with that, I will turn it over to you guys. And um, I know you have some remarks to share and then we'll open it up to questions. James, you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, thank you very much everyone for having us here. Um, so, like Jennifer said, my name is James Murray. I'm the health officer for the town. Uh, what that means is I'm kind of the liaison between the state and the town for anything public health. So where that comes into play with COVID specifically is the governor's safer at home orders, uh, previously the stay at home orders, trying to translate that and um, kind of be the go between between the town and the state when it comes to what this all means. Um, as many of you know, we've also uh, wrote a mask ordinance for the town, a face covering ordinance that has gone into effect now. Um, my position right now is to kind of be at the um, available to the select board when it comes to anything public health, keeping the town up to date, and um, trying to keep everyone as safe and healthy as can be right now. So to that end, I've been working with Darren and other members of the um, other town employees to kind of decipher what's going on with the CDC, uh, DHHS, the Safer at Home guidelines, and our own mask ordinance to um, make that um, kind of digestible for businesses in town and what they should and shouldn't be doing. Um, as many of you know, with the mask ordinance, we went through a few revisions of it, and I think the current one that has passed is pretty much the best fit we could get for Exeter. And uh, there are some exemptions in there for specific businesses. I've been working with a couple businesses in town on um, getting variances for the ordinance. So things like that has pretty much been my day to day recently. Um, Darren, did you have anything? Uh, yeah, I got a bunch. Um, do you want me just to jump in or do you, uh, do you have anything else? You got, uh, Jen, you wanna do questions with him first or just uh, have me roll right into it? Um, why don't we have you roll right into it, and then we can do questions after that. Okay, so uh, forgive me, because I took notes, so I, I can't see you. I can only see my screen right now, because I wanna, don't want to forget things. First thing I want to say is um, chambers are crucial. <laughs> you all know this. Uh, the state apparently doesn't. But um, I want to say that I think that this chamber and other chambers, particularly this chamber, has done just an awesome job. I've gotten nothing but great feedback and anything I can do to support you guys, I'm going to continue to do. Um, the first thing that uh, my department did when this hit was we battled to get the business and good standing list, the contacts, excuse me, <clears throat> and we were able to get that. Uh, generally, they give that away for about $10,000. <laughs> so we shamed them into it. We got it. Um, 
and that was 914 Exeter businesses. Nobody knows. Uh, I was very shocked to see there was that many in Exeter, but there are. And then uh, a couple days later, we were able to get it for the Stratford and Rockingham Planning Commission territories. Uh, so I work with Bob Glowacki um, to create the Town of Exeter COVID-19 Business Outreach Program. <clears throat> this included informational emails regarding COVID state and federal relief programs, resources, pertinent contacts, and many other helpful items. These and an offer from <clears throat> to call me for assistance day or night, seven days a week, was sent to Exeter and all other Rockingham Planning Commission towns and businesses, so 12,000 businesses roughly. Uh, we didn't do poor Portsmouth, because Nancy Carmen, my colleague there, handled Portsmouth. <clears throat> As you can imagine, I've been flooded with uh, requests regarding every conceivable program. This continues, including a call about PPP this morning. Uh, I worked and continue to work closely with Tim Roach of Rockingham Planning to provide assistance to those 12,000 businesses. <clears throat> While many businesses received timely relief, <clears throat> many more got stuck in the ether. And I think we all know some of those businesses and we need to support those and continue to do so. Uh, the good news is that I have an endless contact Rolodex at the state and federal level and get answers pretty quick. Um, that was what we have done. Um, what we are doing now, um, I, I believe you received an email um, from, uh, I think this morning anyway, from, from the chamber regarding the Seacoast Economic Development Stakeholders uh, bang for your buck suggestion. We were asked by Taylor Coswell to uh, tell him what we thought he should do, uh, what the state should do with the remaining uh, CARES Act uh, funding, about 200 to 250 million. Obviously, all of that won't go to the uh, won't go to the um, businesses because there's requests from all kinds of different areas. Uh, however, we submitted something that was basically uh, helping businesses that want to help themselves. Um, I'll just read something very quickly, which I think you'll have. But <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we propose that remaining CARES Act funds be deployed in a manner that will provide the maximum benefit to our economy as a whole. This benefit lies in encouraging businesses to rethink their current or projected business models and transform themselves to become more resilient in the face of economic challenges, which our public health and economic development sources agree are likely to persist until 2022. We're calling it the Business Transition Fund. We'll support those businesses that are most committed to adopting resilient business models, regardless of geographic region or economic sector, and according to the following principles. I'm not going to go through them all, just read the very first one. The deciding factor for allocating funding should be for the business's feasible implementation plan and commitment to innovate to a more resilient business model. While we defer to Gopher to establish And we hope that uh, the state will agree to that and let uh, let folks uh, uh, keep themselves open uh, outdoors through 2022. And that's what I have. Sorry, that's a lot, but you asked for it. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Thanks so much. I know um, uh, Taylor Caswell has been asking uh, 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 economic development directors and chambers for the last couple of weeks uh, about that remaining 250 or 200 to 250 million dollars that's um, left over in the CARES Act to um, to. To, for recommendations on what industries or, uh, or or suggestions on where to spend that. Um, one of the things that he said this morning, we have a weekly call with Taylor Caswell. One of the things that he mentioned this morning, again, was that he continues to get feedback. I really like your proposal, Darren. Um, I look forward to hearing more about that. The other piece that um, that he's keeping an eye on, and, and I suggest other people keep an eye on, is what's happening at the federal level, because as it's written right now, the money from the CARES Act has to be spent, or the money that they're talking about, this 200 to $250 million, has to be spent by the end of the calendar year. It's not even actually the end of the calendar year. It's December 30. 
30th. So it's a day before the end of the calendar year. Um, so, uh, so I know that, that, that there are a lot of eyes on Washington to see if that deadline can be extended into 2021. Um, so lots of moving parts and pieces. Um, and so thanks for being so thoughtful in your proposal, Darren. Thank you. Um, what, uh, what, what questions do, uh, do folks have for our speakers today? <clears throat> I wanted to know if James could elaborate, um, as some of you saw on Facebook, we became a sanitation station for the town of Exeter. James dropped off a whole bunch of great supplies for us. So it's really not a lift on our part, just finding a spot that doesn't have other chamber paraphernalia on it. So I didn't know, James, if you wanted to expand on what that initiative is, how businesses can get involved in Exeter and you know what other businesses can do to help spread the word that you're doing that initiative right now. Sure, so uh, don't let me forget, I still owe you guys a trash can. I'm gonna get that to you. Um, so the sanitation stations, it was brought up while we were passing this ordinance that the ordinance should not be punitive, it should be more educational. And to that end, it was brought up that we need places downtown, especially where this ordinance um, applies, where people, it gets a little more congested. We need stations where people can access hand sanitizer and masks and have a trash can to dispose of masks. It, makes sense that if we're going to be requiring this of our citizens and guests, we should be providing it to them. To that end, I'm able to acquire um, gallons of sanitizer and boxes of masks from the state. And we're trying to set up sanitation stations in downtown businesses. Um, well, we have the, I have the materials here for the health department. I have no way of um, manning the sanitation stations or making sure that they're uh, under observation that they're well stocked and not being, you know, vandalized, let's say. Um, so to that end, we're reaching out to businesses and hoping that more businesses can help us out. Like Kim said, our first one is in the Chamber of Commerce building. I dropped off a bunch of masks the other day, a gallon of sanitizer and some paperwork, some flyers basically, uh, kind of highlighting what the ordinance is, what it's about. And uh, we have some QR codes on there and links through the paperwork that bring people right to the ordinance to explain it better. Um, so I'm basically asking any other businesses downtown that would like to um, host a sanita uh, sanitation station to reach out to me, we can set that up. I can provide the mass sanitizer, the flyers, and um, I'll be getting some trash cans too. So any questions on that? Um, James, can you just say again, if there is a downtown business that, that is interested in serving as a, sanit a sanitation station, or if somebody has a favorite downtown business that they think would be a good sanitation station, what are the next steps for them? So I'll put my contact info in the chat. Basically, just reach out to me and we can set it up. It's pretty simple. Um, I have a bunch of masks here. I have a little bit of sanitizer left, and I'll just bring it down for you with some paperwork to, for you to hang. Um, all you really need is a table and a little bit of space or something to just put the masks on and uh, let me know once things get low and I'll resupply you. Call Dan Chartrand. He'll do it for sure. <laughs> he was. Yeah, I, well, I, that's what I was thinking, that we have a lot of downtown businesses who I'm sure um, would be supportive of serving as a sanitation station. So uh, I think having a, a method for them to connect with you is um, is is great. So, you know, the, the the face covering ordinance has been in effect now for a couple of weeks. What kind of feedback have have you both received on that from either businesses or community members? How do you think it's going? I haven't seen any problems at all. I saw that someone asked a question. James, can you tell the uh, the folks here what towns besides us have that around us, the mask ordinance? So right now for mask ordinances, I know um, Portsmouth and Durham are probably the two big ones. Um, I know, I believe Concord just passed theirs. Um, Hanover, um, I think. Um, Doesn't Newmarket New have it? Newmarket passed one. Uh, so it's, I think it's going to start falling like a domino effect. If the state doesn't pass anything, a lot of the smaller communities will start passing one. Uh, that seems to be the trend so far anyway. And with the cold weather coming, um, flu season coming up, it would probably behoove a lot of communities to start looking into it anyway. I, I've only had one uh, issue. I don't know if you have, James, but this was before the mask ordinance where someone was uh, kind of flipped out on, on, a, on a restaurant. Um, but that was just the only, the only thing I've heard of. I've gotten a few reports here and there, but um, 
you know, nothing major. There's no one running around as like the de facto mask police right now. So um, we do get a couple complaints here and there, but it's usually really easy to handle. Just send the information and education. And um, you know, for, for the most part, everyone's doing their part, which is nice. Thanks for taking the lead on that. Uh, question. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, Darren and James, you guys seem to have a really good relationship, and I know melding, you know, the health concerns of a greater community versus, you know, obviously, Darren, with economic development, it's more business focused. How have you guys been able to meld those so seamlessly and be able to work together and find a common ground? I, common ground is probably a strong term, but how have you guys been able to, to make this work so seamlessly? You guys just seem to have a really good relationship, and business owners really seem to be taking to it. How is can you talk about that process a little bit and what that looks like moving forward as we possibly go into a phase two or phase three of this? What what are you looking at there? I, uh, from my side, I, I think that not not just James and me, but I think a lot of the department heads and uh, this town staff is a very, very solid town uh, staff, I think, and we're well supported by the select board. We have a great town manager. And so it's just easy. James and I have been working together for years on a myriad of issues. So I, I think that has a lot to do with it. Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I remember right when indoor dining closed, when the government shut it down, um, Darren was right in my office that day. Like, what do we need to get out to people? And we're able to work together really well to uh, get the information out to businesses. Uh, I've been with the town for three years. And like Darren said, it's a really cohesive team. So everyone, everyone works together really well. And um, I think the community in general is lucky to have a lot of the employees, including Darren, but, um, you know, people that work for the town here really go above and beyond in a lot of ways, so. I heard something funny, James, I, I don't think you know, but somebody told me yesterday you were having a conversation with them and, they, and you said uh, to that person, um, wow, a uh, few months ago, nobody knew who I, who I was, now everybody does. I, I liked it better the other way. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, before I was mostly just the health inspector. So yeah, the, the kitchens throughout town knew me, but this year has been, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yep. What do you guys kind of foresee as some future, I don't want to say problems, but what what is it looking like on your end? Can I know you can't really project kind of what's going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen, but what have we learned from this first phase that we're trying to apply to the future moving forward? Well, from our side of it, the economic development side of it, I think the state did a pretty good job, certainly better than any, any other state around us in terms of uh, packaging and getting money out onto the street. All kinds of picadillos uh, with it, all kinds of problems, they persist. But I think right now you have a $2.2 trillion uh, package from the Democrats, the Republicans, I, I don't know where their number is at. I do believe they'll get together and there will be more funding. Um, I certainly believe there'll be more PPP. And I think that uh, that'll be, it'll be, the systems are in place. The way it was described earlier uh, when we were first going through this months ago was basically building an airplane while we were flying. Um, and now I think that uh, the systems are in place. Gopher has got a pretty good handle on where the money should flow through. So if there is more money coming, or like Jen said, if there's an extension, um, I think that we can expect it to go more smoothly. However, anybody who watched the debate last night, we don't know what's going to happen at the federal level. So um, we're going to have to wait and watch and see and, and, and take it as it comes. But in terms of systems, I think we're in a much better place. From the uh, public health side of things, you know, the information from the CDC, DHHS, uh, sometimes come in conflict with each other. I guess, uh, you know, that was kind of difficult at first to figure out, um, you know, what was the right move. We're getting to a point now where the state is, you know, able to give us really good quality information that applies directly to New Hampshire. Uh, for example, we're looking into the holiday season and Halloween. Right now, the CDC is saying that Halloween trick-or-treating is a high-risk activity, but um, you know, the state of New Hampshire, we're doing pretty well, and they're, they're giving us more guidance this afternoon as to what towns and communities can and should do. So I think the streamlining of information that applies directly to us has improved tremendously. And to that end, we're, you know, on my end, doing what I can to get that information out to the town as well. So I think it's improving, and um, we'll see where the holiday season takes us. But I think at this point, we're, we've gotten a better handle on it than we did in the beginning, for sure.
Thank you, guys. We did have a question come in from Linda. Uh, she asked if there's anything we can do as members of the community to assist moving forward from your perspective. I can say from my side, James, James, you got something you want to say to that? I mean, going back to the sanitation stations, anyone that can help with that to uh, get the masks and information out there. Um, the ordinance is kind of a, it's an educational opportunity. And I think that the sanitation stations can also benefit the businesses providing them. So if any business is willing to or wants to, um, that would be very helpful on my end. And I'd love to love to work with you. And this, and obviously you're talking about just the town of Exeter. Correct. For that. Do you know of any other surrounding towns that are starting to implement that for some of our business owners who aren't strictly based in Exeter? I don't know of any yet. Um, okay. I'm going to be reaching out to the surrounding communities later today, specifically on the trick or treat. Uh, Halloween okay. thing. So I'll, I will be bringing that up as well to see where other communities are at. Um, Great. And I we can always, know. and we can always share that information too. As you know, we cover 10 communities. So any other that are in there, we're happy to share that information as well to try to spread the word and help that effort for sure. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And Darren. Yep. Uh, in terms of supporting economic development, if you, uh, if you folks or that your board wants to uh, uh, jump on the bandwagon with this, uh, this legislation, uh, Senator Morgan and I are pushing, happy to have you. Um, also, if you do like what you saw in our uh, Seacoast, just named ourselves yesterday, Seacoast Economic Development Stakeholder uh, proposal to go for, uh, if you like that and want to support it, uh, let, uh, let Jen, let Travis know, uh, uh, Taylor know. And that, yeah, that PDF um, Darren sent me this morning that I sent out to you folks who registered. If you didn't get it or it somehow got misplaced, I'm happy to resend that. So just shoot me an email or um, let me know in the chat that you didn't get it. I'm happy to resend that out so everybody has what um, Darren is referring to. He's been working really hard. Um, anyone on the call have any questions? I know I've spoken a lot and asked a lot of questions. Anyone on here have anything that's burning that they want to get answered? Hey, Darren, Dave Pitro from the hospital. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just kind of the general environment around economic development right now and whether, uh, you know, your portfolio, what your portfolio looks like now and, and what you see looking forward? Uh, sure, and thanks for the question. Um, uh, there are tremendous supply chain issues, uh, you know, throughout everything, uh, every industry, and it's, it's causing, you know, pretty significant problems. Um, so again, it's hard to say what's going to happen. I do believe there will be some more money coming out, but, uh, there are just, it is very challenging. I, I think, um, as it is, I, I use, uh, Rob Fakar, who we all know really well, uh, as an example, um, first he businesses that do what he does and he, he relies on, um, for instance, he relies on bowling leagues, on dart leagues, on pool leagues. And there's a lot of businesses, that's just one business, but there's a lot of businesses that have certain issues that very unfortunately, you have to be the squeaky wheel. And so that's why folks like me are trying to partner with those businesses that are, that are having so much trouble. Um, and I, I foresee retail, uh, continuing to take a very, very big hit. Um, I, we have, a, there's a huge distribution warehousing thing going up on 125. I think you're gonna keep seeing that. Um, and the industries that are being affected by this, the, the, the employees of that are probably gonna have to uh, figure out something else to do, because I, I, I believe a lot of these are just gonna struggle into the future. I mean, that remote, I, I think, the one thing the pandemic did that was positive is everybody learned how to do Zoom and other WebEx and whatnot right away at the same time. And so this is not going away. I mean, we were talking about how much money just as a town we're going to save not having uh, employees travel, you know, 20 miles, 60 miles to go to meetings that we would, it would employees hundreds of employees go away all the time to do, to do this stuff. And it's just going to save a fortune and businesses are doing the same thing. So I think it's going to completely reform our, our whole entire uh, workforce. And by the way, just as a funny note, my, uh, my sister-in-law said something funny where she was talking about zoom and she's like, uh, how did Skype, Skype had a 10 year head start. How'd they screw this up? <laughs> well, that was funny. Thank you, David, and thank you, Darren, for the answer on that. Anyone else have anything they'd like to ask? Feel free to unmute and just go for it. I'll just, oh, go for it. No, go for it, Darren. You're good. 
Uh, just say to Dan, um, uh, happy to help, by the way, if you, uh, I understand what you're trying to do and obviously it must be challenging. If you want to give me a call sometime, I'm happy to give you a hand. Now you're on the good list, Aaron, because you're going to help Sarah. Oh. So nice work out of you. <laughs> James, I had a question in regards to restaurants. I just thought of this um, where Darren was talking about, you know, stuff's not going away and we're planning ahead. Are you seeing anything on the health inspector side with regards to restaurants? Do you think anything will, this will change how you go and inspect, you know, restaurants, food festivals, things of that nature moving forward? We, um, there was actually a conference between the self-inspecting communities yesterday with the state and uh, they brought up virtual inspections. I don't know how that's gonna work. Um, one of the problems they found with it is that whoever's leading the camera around or whatever obviously isn't going to show you where any problems are. So I think that's kind of a situation that it's going to stay basically the same. Um, it's always going to be something where you need to be there visually inspecting everything. Um, but as for like policies and procedures, that kind of thing, there is um, information from ServeSafe out there on how to operate during COVID. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some updates to the next food code involving that, but at this time, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, so a lot of things are, I think they're gonna stay pretty much the same when it comes to at least the inspections and working with restaurants in that aspect. The sad, the sad thing is, I think uh, SBDC was predicting something like 30 to 40 percent of restaurants won't make it. Yeah. yeah, we had them on, I think the last last virtual connect we had, we had Warren Daniel on and Liz Gray, and they they spoke to that as well. So that was that was not a good statistic to, to hear. And unfortunately, I think it's a real one from what we're seeing. So are there any other questions on here that anyone wants to ask? before we possibly, yeah, sure, Susan, go for it. Hi, um, I'm Susan Young with Clean by the Sea. Um, we actually do a lot of cleaning in the Exeter area um, and in the town. And I guess my kind of question is for the funding, our goal has always been to employ really stand up people, um, give them a great job opportunity. It's always been very difficult, but this has made it super hard to find those people. Um, we've increased their pay. I feel like I want to provide a service that is um, priced well so companies can actually afford to use us. Um, is there advice on that, what people should do when they provide a service that is essential and necessary? Um, but finding the people is tough. So we've had to turn down working for businesses that I honestly just really want to help out. So if you advice on, on that payment and um, finding those people. So do you, um, do, do you get my emails? Are you on, my, on the list when I send them out? I think that I do. Yes. So I, I would double check. Yeah, please. And, and, and uh, send me an email if, um, you know, via Jen, if you don't have my contact. But uh, so there's a new resource. They came out with about a month, month and a half ago to try to connect businesses that have uh, open positions and employees. Did you have you used that? Have you tried it? I have not. That sounds amazing, actually. Okay, So if you don't that, that was on one of those emails, actually, in most of them. But uh, just give me a uh, send me an email. I'll send you that that uh, that location. And then um, you're not you know, you don't have the franchise, unfortunately, on uh, on hiring right now it's just very very difficult and it's surprising that it is um i could go into a lot of detail about how some companies are trying to bring in workers from other places and it's just it's a nightmare um it's just unfortunate but the work the, the largest problem we have and we're going to have for the next 20 years is workforce housing um and so the people that would work for you uh depending on how much they would make and you're not i mean osram for instance can't get people uh there's like a weekly, uh, uh, Cobham has like a weekly uh, job fair. I mean, it just no, no, none of these companies can really find anybody because people can't afford to live here. And so like Lint, for instance, uh, and uh, Growing Gift Baskets bring vans full of people every day from say Haverhill and, uh, and places like that where people can afford to live. And so that's, that's the big issue. Um, please contact me though. I, we'll, we'll go into detail. I'll try to file, try to put you onto a good resource. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. Yes, Bobby, I'll send that to you. Anyone else have any questions for either Darren or James? Okay, I'll go for it. Yeah, I do. Uh, more for James. 
And I, I think I'm kind of unique here in that we are a volunteer driver program providing service to residents of 10 communities, including uh, Exeter. We have over the last several months put together because there's not a whole lot out there for, essentially we're a ride share program, except it's all volunteer based. If I were to get in touch with you offline and send you our a quick, our policies, procedures, what we're doing to try to mitigate the spread of COVID, could you, would you be willing to give me a little advice on whether we're in the right direction? I mean, it, it's really simple. Yeah, absolutely. Masks, hand sanitizers, windows open a little bit, sit in the back seat. Um, terrific. I will pop you an email later on. Thank you. Sure. That's all. Thank you, Carol. And I'll make sure um, in the follow up email that you all get from me um, after this, uh, Darren's email, as well as uh, James's email, if that's okay with you too, uh, just so people can get in touch with any follow up questions or any uh, additional information that you guys have. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, if there aren't any any uh, other burning questions anyone wants to ask, I'll turn it over to you two to give us your final thoughts for people for the day before we wrap up and whoever wants to start that. Go ahead, James. I just want to thank everyone again for the opportunity to speak today. And, um, you know, thank you for all you're doing for the community as well. Um, a lot of the businesses, not just in Exeter, but in the uh, Rochester and... Um, sorry, the Rockingham County and, you know, New Hampshire in general, the businesses are, they've been put in a very, very difficult position right now. And I appreciate everything all of you are doing to help keep our people safe. And I'll just say the same thing. It's, uh, I, you guys have been such an important part of what's happened over the last several months. I mean, Jen, the whole staff, Bobby, um, you know, Kim just done a great, great job and anything we can do to support you guys will continue to do it. Um, and congratulations on uh, securing that deal for your location in downtown Exeter. That was really important. And I'm glad you guys were able to pull that off. Thank you, we are too. <laughs> we didn't have one have to look for a new space in the middle of all of this, so thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. This is a really good discussion. It has been recorded, so it will live on our website in the next few days. So if there's anyone you want to share this conversation with um, after this, that's completely fine. Uh, we will have a virtual connect next week. We'll have um, everyone knows I'm Melissa Corn Wilson from Your Big Deal Branding. She'll be joining us along with her partner, Amy, and they will be talking about um, creativity and technology for small businesses. So we're working out the details of that, but that should be a good one as well to now that we've gone through the first six, seven months of this hell that we've been in, how can we continue to push our businesses forward and stay afloat? So that will be a good discussion next week. So stay tuned for that. With that, thank you to James and Darren. Thank you, Kelly and Kenny Bunk Savings for their sponsorship. And I will have a follow-up email with all this information coming out very soon. Thank you folks very much. We'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, guys.